Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage President Majid Advisors Mike Vorhas. 女士们、先生们，下面请欢迎来自 Majid Advisors 顾问公司的主席 Mike Vorhas 先生。Okay, how is everybody today? You, you're just like in school. Maybe I don't know if it's that way in China or not, but everybody sits in the back and to the far. See, if you all came together, we'd be one happy, tight group. Okay,、uh, we're going to show you some movie clips because Lorenzo is a movie producer and mogul. You won't find that in every English Chinese dictionary. Uh, I'll just tell you a tiny bit about him before we show you some of his、uh, movie highlights. Lorenzo's、uh, grew up in Vermont, which those of you not from the United States, it's a tiny, tiny little state above Boston. Went to school in Connecticut and Boston, graduated from Harvard, played semi-professional、uh, uh, soccer, football, European football, in Italy.、Uh, worked on Wall Street briefly.、Uh, ran a river rafting company where people go down dangerous rivers. Um, went to Wharton Business School, and all that led up to what you're about to see. And here's Lorenzo. Okay, so、um, tell us the backstory. How does one go from Vermont to making 20, 30 movies as a producer and supervising what probably a couple hundred movies as a executive at Warner Brothers before you're an independent producer? What's the what's the backstory from Vermont to Hollywood? <laughs> It's a pretty chaotic backstory.、Um, I have to say,、uh, it was really about confusion more than anything that drove me.、Uh, I kept looking for the thing that would excite me. And I kept not finding it. So I was reaching into my late twenties when I finally decided, you know what? The one thing I'm really, truly passionate about is the movie business. So I hadn't really thought much about it growing up on the East Coast. We don't really think of it on the East Coast as a business. You know, we think of it as movies. You know, Hollywood. And、uh, so when I graduated from Wharton, I came out here and had got an executive job,、uh, a business job at Columbia Pictures. And then、um, managed to wind my way through distribution, marketing,、uh, into the office of the president of Columbia, and then I moved over to Warner Brothers, where I started on the creative side at the lowest rung. And、uh, five and a half years later, I was president of Warner Brothers, and、um, got a great education there. Bob Daly and Terry Samuel were probably the two best movie executives that. And he, I certainly can remember in the 30 years I've worked in the business, and you know, my success to a large extent is、uh, has a lot to do with how I learned at Warner Brothers what it, may, meant, it meant to make it a successful movie. Okay, so movie production's been your your big、uh, emphasis, but you've done some TV too. As a matter of fact, I had a chance to to watch in a binge some of your recent TV <laughs> production work. Tell us a little bit about film versus TV. Uh, pros and cons. What do you like? What do you not like?、Mm -hmm. Well, I can't say I've done that much television, but my experience in television is what I like about, I'll say, the medium, is the notion of telling a story over a broader spectrum of time.、Uh, and there's a freedom、uh, in some areas of of film of TV distribution where you're not held to ratings and.、Uh, How big was the weekend box office, and that、uh, I'm really looking forward to participating in that because you don't have the pressure that that comes with this scrutiny.、Uh, but you know what's what's interesting is the rhythm of storytelling is quite a bit different.、Uh, you know, in a movie, we're required to come up with a full narrative and conclude it in two hours or less, and I and that demands a thoroughness and a rigor. To keep it within that two hours. What's interesting about going past that is, it's not that you have to be less rigorous. It's a different form, which is you have to have enough material to keep everybody interested. And I think it allows. I know it allows you much more flexibility in terms of the amount of characters you can br bring in. It also, right now, I think,、um, in an interesting switch, it is the more.、Uh, 
there's more freedom in television from a content point of view than there is in movies. And for years, it was the opposite. And is that driven by the, the new purchasers of your of, of the TV shows and the movies? Is that driven by, by Netflix and Hulu and Amazon? And I think it's driven by a whole bunch of confluences. Uh, there's no question that Netflix and Hulu and have opened up another avenue. But I'd say before they came aboard, cable television, in a very loose uh, description, was venturing into areas that uh, AMC, you know, uh, Mad Men, uh, that was pushing the envelope on storytelling, and the audience was rewarding it for it. And so you saw other channels and brands pushing towards that creatively, whereas in the movie business, the uh, corporatization of the movie business has made it more and more cautious in its content, which has caused a problem, I think, with the content. Is this the place where I don't ask you how you think AT&T will do <laughs> in terms of making movies? I have no idea, but I sure hope that they let the movie professionals do it. You hope they make them with you. <laughs> well, I'm sure. I'd be happy to do it. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the business model that's uh, emerging with these new buyers. It's not just the, the big studios. Now it's these big consumer subscription companies with billions of dollars. Is it, is it the exact same financial arrangement with a producer? Is it different? How is it different? Well, I think, I think there's, a few, there's a few answers to that question. And I think the first thing is, is there is a certain amount of confusion about what we're supposed to bring, in part because the, the horizon seems so large. So I think uh, everybody's trying to figure out what is the limitations of the horizon for, from, a, from a content point of view. From a financial point of view, you know, there are trade-offs. Uh, certainly, um, the idea of a certain payout that you can get from something like Netflix is highly uh, attractive. On the other hand, uh, there's a ceiling to it. So, you know, I don't think, but I think at the end of the day, most people, most producers are driven by the excitement of what their project is, not so much about the remuneration from it. And. Are you suggesting they give you all the money at once, or I know I know when you do traditional work for Paramount or Sony or whatnot that you get checks for years afterwards, and people fight over what the profit was. And well, I haven't done a Netflix yet, but my my understanding is is that they pay you up front and they give you a certain premium to have waived your back end. So uh, that's an advantage to get paid right up front. And if you're ever doing an independent movie, you really like the idea of getting paid up front because uh, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, you don't actually get paid. That's interesting. Or not all of what you've got should be paid. So get, get the money before you, you open your mouth on stage. Feels pretty good when you do. Uh-huh. Um, Okay, let's talk a little bit about something that I know has been important to you and uh, certainly been important to Hasbro, the toy company. Uh, for those of you that are not super familiar with the American toy industry, Hasbro and Mattel are the two big kings of the, of the industry. You've made a, a number of movies uh, and a huge franchise with, with Michael Bay and uh, I guess I should say Geffen Spielberg and uh, Katzenberg just to keep us not in trouble with anybody, right? We credit everybody, right, with, with Transformers. Yep. Um, tell us about that. I mean, was that a toy to you? Did you love the idea of bringing this? Was it, was it a, a, a marketing business decision? What, how, did, how did you make a brand into a movie? Well, I think one of the misnomers about it and what has led to a few, I think, kind of disastrous toy-based movies is that Transformers had a wildly successful and deep comic book and um, uh, uh, animated television series. So there's actually a ton of, of characterization, of mythology, et cetera. So we weren't looking at it as a toy. We were looking at it as, okay, there's this pretty extensive mythology. Does it transfer to film? We thought it did. And then the question became, you know, how deep is the fan base for this? Which I was too old to grow up playing it, but my friends' younger brothers and sisters were playing with it when I was in college. 
So you, or just after college. So I, so I saw the fascination that they held and the whole notion of a car becoming a, a robot and that, that sentient notion. So I saw it as a creative thing and having done a lot of visual effects movies, I understood that we could do something really extraordinary with the robots. You know, I frankly couldn't have imagined what Michael Bay did do with them, you know, the creative, uh, our partners, ILM, Digital Domain, Double Negative, and the, in the visual effects world had a lot to do with it. But Michael really pushed the notion of transformation and the, the exotic nature of what that felt like. And so we had spectacle and we had um, an unusual thing to show. We had surprise. Uh, what kind of brands uh, or real life uh, objects could possibly be in, in future movies that you would consider? Um, well, first of all, on brands and, and product placement or uh, uh, promotional partners, I'm a big fan of it uh, because I think when you see a movie that has been whitewashed of brands, it doesn't feel at all real to me. You look around a room, what do you see? You see a whole bunch of brands. So I think this notion of you're selling out or this is gauche or uh, how uncool of you, I think it's missing the point and I think that's a very old fashioned point of view. I think that uh, you know it actually el gives you an element of reality to what's going on. So I think you know what's been interesting for us is that uh, there have been a lot of Chinese brands that have participated in Transformers in particular. Uh, where you get to know what it is their goals are for their brand and how that works with our movie. And sometimes the movie can embrace it and sometimes it can't. You just can't say, hey, every brand come on in because then it, f then it does feel like what people fear, which is just sort of wall-to-wall -wall, uh, commercialization, you know, whereas, I mean, you walk down the street. I, I remember one of the great product placements that I've been part of is in uh, Salt with Angelina Jolie. She leaps off a bridge and lands on a truck. The whole thing is about, the whole gag is of this incredible uh, stunt, really, and she's barely holding on the side of the truck, and right there is royal purple. Um, you know, do you see a lot of trucks with branding on them when you drive around? Of course. So, is that the UPS of England, or no? That is, <laughs> no. It's an oil. Uh, co it's a company that does uh, automo automobile oil, and so. Uh, but it's interesting to me because that, in many ways, is like, no one's going. Well, why is a brand there? They're going. How exciting is this? And if they pick it up, great. And if they don't, they didn't miss anything. And did Royal Purple pay for this? A little bit, yeah. I th of course. Uh, you know, people want to get their brands in movies and depending on how you want to do it. And again, there's definitely limitations to it. Uh, you know, and some movies actually can really embrace it and some just can't. It just really depends on the kind of movie you're making. Not likely to see too many brands in, uh, in uh, Game of Thrones. Well, yeah, I'll give you an example though. Right now we're making a spinoff to Transformers called Bumblebee, which is Bumblebee's movie. It's set in 1987. There are not a lot of companies that want to sell their brands set in 1987, <laughs> right? So there's a perfect example of a movie that just doesn't fit the, the notion of, of bringing them in to be part of it. So you're really looking for stories more than you're looking for a commercial quick hit at the bank. Yeah, I don't think there's such a thing as being able to just... You know, I think every once in a while something like that can happen. I mean, when I was at Warner Brothers, we had Pokemon movies. I, to the life of me, I couldn't figure out anything about them. I didn't understand a thing. Kids came in droves. They loved it, you know. So there's a good example of a brand, but it was, you know, some people see that as a toy. Kids saw it as they watched those cartoons. They participated. It was part of their existence. Um, it was always funny to sort of watch the dazed look of the parents who came out of those movies where they were like, what did I just watch, you know? But the kids were animated and they loved what they were, they were seeing. You mentioned uh, Chinese brands also. Yeah. Are these brands people bring to your attention or when you're in China, are you spending time looking at local media? How do you, I figure out how you get a brand in the United States to your attention. Uh -huh. 
I think it's a combination of things, and it's also, again, driven by what the desire of the movie is, right? So um, in a movie like Transformers, where there's a lot of cars, the natural question is what Chinese cars could fit into the movie? Uh, so you then do your research about what Chinese companies are out there, and I didn't know a lot about the Chinese automobile industry. I know a little bit more now. Um, and so it's really driven in large part by that, but there are people hear about the movie made and they find a way to reach out to us and say, hey, how about our brand, you know? Um, and there's a significant amount of, uh, you know, in a time frame where it is so hard to get consumers' attentions, uh, attention, the ability to reach out on a promotional basis outside the just the TV advertising is incredibly important, or internet advertising, you know? Um, in addition to the changes that are going on in terms of who's buying movies, mm -hmm. uh, what other sort of changes do you see in the theater-based environment? Some people say nobody wants to go out to a movie anymore. Everybody wants to stay at home with their, with their texting. They're on their WeChat or WhatsApp here. Yeah. Uh, it's a little daunting right now, I think, for us to know where we're headed because there increasingly are reasons to draw people's attention to other things than movies, you know. Um, we still have the advantage of spectacle. And I think that's one of the reasons why the movie business has shifted more and more to spectacle, because it is where you cannot replicate that experience in a, in a, movie, in a, in a home environment, nor, and I think it's also true with comedies, it's, you know, I enjoy going to see a comedy and hearing a lot of people laugh. It makes me laugh more. Uh, seeing at home, you know, with two or three people, hopefully everybody's laughing a lot, but it's just not that same sort of group experience. So I think there are a lot of people that will always appreciate that. You know, I think the biggest thing we face right now is that the youngest generations that are coming into the movie business right now, we have two issues with them. One is, is that their attention to video games and to the internet is they consume a lot of time there. So that's a direct competitor to us. And the other is, especially for young males, the movie business has veered towards PG-13 rather than R. And I don't know about you guys growing up, but I wouldn't be caught in a PG-13 when I was a mid to late teenager. Um, I wanted to see an R-rated movie. And um, so there, I think that's created a problem for us with young males is we don't really have the product to attract them because they play extremely violent games and very visceral experiences and we're bringing sometimes just PG-13, a movie like Transformers or a movie that I'm just finishing up called Meg, um, which is about a, a megalodon, giant shark, prehistoric shark. Uh, they provide spectacle and a certain toughness to them that can appeal to that. And, and you know, and I've also been reflecting on the fact that um, I think for the movie business to be really rele relevant, we have to be far bolder in the creativity that we're bringing forward. You know, I look back, and I've <laughs> talked about this with a lot of friends, and we were educated about what the world was from, from R-rated movies. You know, they, they were move not just R-rated, but often R-rated because they're giving you a very cutting edge experience. Uh, probably into a world you don't know. I rem uh, if, if there's a m two movies that are responsible for me being in the movie business, it's Apocalypse Now and Deer Hunter. I was shook by that experience. I found it wildly fascinating and it opened my eyes to something I didn't think of at all in terms of the Vietnam War, but also just who went there, how, what happened to people, how it tore them apart. That's a visceral experience and it's pushing our knowledge cult of culture, sort of American culture in those two cases, forward. Uh, we need to do more of that. Okay, what, what about Chinese culture uh, and other countries outside the West uh, coming here? Is there a commercial uh, viable opportunity to do that? Chinese mythology? I think, uh, I think the, the, the transition point right now where there are a lot of co-productions starting to be seen. This, the, we're working, I've worked on two, and I'm working on a potential third right now. And what's tricky about it is, is that there are some mythologies and some 
cultural values that are really similar across any culture. You know, uh, to a certain degree, bravery, heroism, they're pretty monolithic when you come down to it. But then you get to very specific things within certain cultures that are so different. You know, for instance, uh, I have been approached several times to make to, by Chinese uh, companies to produce a version of the Monkey King. Uh, I've read the Monkey King. It's an incredible mythology. I don't understand it at all. As a as a Western storytelling thing, there is the lead character is able to keep transforming into whatever he needs to do from my perspective, and therefore it loses jeopardy. So that's a thing. And just as I'm, you know, America, certain American comedies and certain American cultural things have nothing in relationship to. China. So I think the key to the co-productions, or I'll even just say working together in the film business, is finding those projects where the cultural overlap is so clear. And to steer clear of the ones that it isn't, because there are some that will never be right for both audiences. There'll be a lot that's right for, for both audiences, but there'll be some that won't work. And this, um, your involvement with China and this role of, of, of uh, Chinese uh, filmmakers and Chinese finance. Is this a new thing of five or 10 years? Did this exist 20 years ago? Oh, it's a pretty new thing. I, I went to China uh, when we were beginning Transformers 2. So that's probably eight or nine years ago. Uh, that's the first time I really had heard anybody in our business talking about China as a real important aspect to what it is we were doing. I'm sure other people were, but it wasn't in my um, uh, experience. And going over to China, you began to see things that were, you know, you had to learn partly how to act because it is a different cultural demands. Um, but more than anything, you had to become, start understanding what this, what that consumer wants and why do they want it, you know? And that's a slow process. You can't learn that overnight. And I don't think the only way you can learn that is going over there and spending some time. You know, go to a movie theater and see what is translating in terms of why are they going, you know, which theaters are full. What, did that, what is that movie about? Um, and I think that's the, the knowledge we continue to have to get uh, on both sides, but especially for, I'll say, knowing uh, how my own experience, the more I go over there, the more I begin to understand what that marketplace is like, what those people want, and frankly, the more I see how strong the similarities are. And at first, they feel much further apart than after a period of time, in my experience. So some people claim the rate of change in China is 10 times the rate of change in the United States, what takes you know, one or two years in China to happen, it'll take five to 10 years in the United States to happen. Certainly it looks that way in terms of the, the architecture and the beautiful buildings and... Well, and they certainly, you know, I... Uh, well, as a, as, a, as a government for a long time, change was not embraced. Since they've changed, embraced change, they're moving much quicker. It doesn't surprise me they're moving quicker than us. They have some ground to catch up on some levels, but also, uh, it is a professed desire of the establishment, if you would, as opposed to the isolationism that's going on in our country. We could talk about that, couldn't we? Forever. Uh, Sadly. Well, I, I, I feel there's something appropriate with the, <laughs> the next question, uh, uh, now that you referred to our... Uh, he is president of the United States still, right? I'm not sure who you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> so tell me about virtual reality. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, uh, virtual reality has come through Hollywood at least three times since I've started. Um, it's going to be the next big thing. It's going to be the next big thing. I have to say, after the two times when it wasn't the big, next big thing, I had a lot of skepticism this time. Uh, I have to say also that having now experienced VR and it's how sophisticated it's become and how much you can see it growing, I think it's here to stay f for the first time. Uh, I, certainly I believe that, you know, and um, I've had the opportunity to play video games with my boys and uh, it's a whole different experience. Um, 
it is visceral. It is, you, you can unbalance yourself physically. Uh, it really is a participation on a physical and mental level. And so the visual, uh, the um, quantity of content right now is not that much, but you could see given its possibilities that that's gonna catch up real fast. And you know, I think the question becomes for the film industry is, is there a way to replicate that in a movie theater? And I, I can't puzzle that out right now. I, don't, I, I think we have to understand it a little bit more. Um, in a minute, we're going to show uh, some uh, footage from, uh, from uh, some of your Transformers uh, uh, shooting that you did in China. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, what it was like shooting in China and maybe just uh, explain for us what we're about to see? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I've now done it twice. Um, the first time was The Great Unknown. Uh, the second time was a little more comfortable because I had understood some of the experience of it. And also, interestingly enough, the difference in the crew from the first movie, first time I did it to the second time, was quite different. And not, this is not a good or bad uh, thing. It is they had learned the aspects of how we made films, so the integration was in easier. The first time, the integration was very difficult. We were saying black and they were thinking white and vice versa. And it was one of the big lessons about uh, cultural differentiations is how you presented information to a U.S. crew that you did every day of every movie. If you did exactly the same thing in certain circumstances with a Chinese crew, you were insulting them without having any knowledge that you were insulting them. So one of the examples that I have is, is that... Um, you know, on every movie, as far as I know, from, since the beginning of movie making, there is a thing called a call sheet, and we issue it, and if it's on location, on the back of it, there's a map. And we found the first two times we went on location in China, it was havoc because nobody, you know, some people would arrive at the right time, some people would arrive an hour later, some two hours later, some three hours later, which really was causing a problem. And we found out that however we had communicated this, and, and it's still not entirely clear to me how they came to this conclusion, but the drivers saw it as we were saying to them, we Americans know where you're going, you don't know where you're going, here's the map. So they tore it up. But the problem was a lot of them didn't know where they were going. <laughs> so they had felt disrespected by us, but we couldn't have imagined that that would be the reaction to a call sheet. So, you know, <laughs> so, you, so you go through something like that and you suddenly go, okay, you know what, we have to be really careful about understanding the delivery of information, not just, you know, the cultural aspect of it. So uh, the second time I, I did just not, uh, just last year actually in Sanyo Bay, um, I found the Chinese crew had clearly learned a lot about how we do business, just as we learned from them, it just made it a lot easier. We knew more how they worked, they knew more how we worked, and it was much quicker and much easier on everybody. Do you find more uh, English spoken by the Chinese each time you've been? Um, you know, have, finding people who speak English in China is really easy. Uh, it really is. Now that said, when you go, we went um, to a national park, Oolong, and you are going, you know, deeper into the country, there you start running into a lot of people who don't speak English. Did you guys have any Mandarin speakers with you na natively or, or just translators? We had both. Okay, let's look at uh, some uh, beautiful fo footage shot in China uh, by uh, Lorenzo's crew. All right. Very beautiful. Um, so that's a, a beautiful example of the sort of creative work that movie makers like you uh, undertake. Uh, there's a lot of people involved. You've got a director. Luckily, there's, no, there's not too many co-directors, right? No, there's only one director <laughs> on our movie. But, uh, you know what's interesting about it is, as I look at it, what's interesting about it is, is that we've shot probably in China, you know, I'm going to say eight or nine locations in Beijing. Then we went to the Great Wall. Then we went to Shenzhen. Then we were in Oolong. We, then we were um, in Hong Kong, obviously, there. And... There are several things about it 
you know, the, like in every country, the further you get away from the center, the harder it is to mount your production, just like the United States. Um, but there are certain things that resonate for the Chinese audience that don't resonate for us necessarily. So, for instance, in the casting, in there you saw you saw the guy in the car with the guitar. He is a major uh, music star uh, named Hong Kong. And so for the Chinese audience, they're like, oh, he's in the movie, isn't that fun? Most of us don't recognize him. Just as the, the, the unassuming guy in the elevator comes out and starts punching the hell out of the much bigger guy, was the um, first uh, boxing gold medalist for China uh, named uh, Zhou Ximing. And, you know, f he is a national hero for being that. And so for the Chinese audience, they love that. Just as we have certain things that we're going to relate to and respond to that won't mean anything to them. Um, so I know you get a lot of opinions from the studios and from uh, your partners in production. Um, how have you found that to be in China? You, do you get more input from your co-production? And explain to us how a co-production works in general uh, in China and the U.S. Uh, well, I, it probably depends on your partners and how much you're in sync, first of all. Um, you know, I've had two really good experiences, and I'm in the beginning of a third one that seems to be going really well. Um, the first thing is, is that you have to get out of way, way quickly understanding what each side is really, really wants and expects of this. So uh, you do get another set of notes. That is frustrating. You know, we're all getting a lot of notes in Hollywood from a lot of different entities. So yes, you do have another one. On top of that, you do have censorship in China. And uh, so there's a criteria that is not easy to know. You can guess at it, and the more you experience it, the more you have a sense of what can pass muster and what can't. But you're guessing to some extent, and your co-producing partner can help you a lot with that. Um, uh, and, and you know the sensitivities of each place, you can really help. Uh, there were certain things when we were shooting in Hong Kong, for instance, that they did not want to see the Hong Kong police be shamed, if you would. So they are very heroic in the movie, you know. And by the way, that fit the movie, so we didn't have to bend it for that. But you hear different criteria for different places, and your partner f can, one, anticipate them, so tell you earlier in the creative process, so if we need to make an adjustment, and, it, and it's an adjustment we're willing to make, it's much easier than going way down the road and suddenly realizing, oh my God, what have we done? Um, and so I think that's really part of it. And financially, they have a vote. Uh, so they and the studio have to reach agreement. There's another group that has to reach agreement about uh, who wins which vote. And this happens early in the process? I mean, when the script is first... Uh, uh, finished, you, you distribute it to your partners? And it happens all the way through it. It really does. Every day there's more input. There is. And uh, uh, there's pretty much specific stages where you get the most. In the script development, you get a lot. In the editorial, you get a lot. When you're shooting, not so much. Because you've sort of agreed on what you're going to go do. And then it's the interpretation of what you shot, which now you have to begin to reanalyze. Um, so uh, it's really important to pick the right partner because if, one, they're not communicative about the things you're doing wrong, because sometimes, unlike Americans, the Chinese are very polite about a lot of things, they may be too polite not to tell you you're making a mistake because they don't want to embarrass you. And so you need your partner to go, listen, I'm not embarrassed. Please don't put, don't, you know, whatever I'm doing wrong, shout it out right away. I have thick skin. I'm from Hollywood. All right, so you've made um, a lot of movies. Uh, all of them, including the ones you've made with the Chinese, have been Western-oriented stories done uh, with the West as the primary uh, market for the movies, I believe. Uh, I, Transformers, it's interesting, because originally that's what we thought. But when I went to, to Shanghai... Uh, for Transformers 2, what I discovered was is that 
during the 80s when the Transformers television series was uh, on television, it was one of the very few things that the Chinese government had permitted to be televised in China. So Transformers is incredibly important to any Chinese person who grew up in that time frame. It's one of the few, one or there's only two as far as I know, Western or, or I'll say non-Chinese content that was happening for kids, but also because it has such a rich uh, thing for a child, a lot of their fable, their sense of imagination comes from that. And the reason I found out was we do something called a previs, which is, um, in a way, think of it as a cartoon where we're trying to figure out where the Transformers are going to be in a shot and what is the action going to look like. And I had brought some, and I was sitting in the theater with uh, a few of the companies that were wanting to get aboard, and I was introduced them as this is the target of China. And I was sitting with the CMO and the, C and the CEO, and I noticed there were tears in their eyes as they're watching this, which was like, what could they possibly be crying about? We're watching a, a <laughs> robot smashing into each other, you know? Um, and that's when they told me after the fact how much it meant to them because it was such an important component of their childhood. How could you know that, one? And two, the result of that was partly why we got to a co-production with them was because we understood just how significant it was for that culture. Do you think we'll see, uh, well, let me ask this in two ways. Are there movies that those of us who love stories and love movies are missing because we don't speak Mandarin or American companies aren't bringing those movies over today? I see these hundreds of millions of dollars every week being spent by Chinese consumers on movies or, you know, I, you know, I, I think of uh, the Crouching Tiger. I don't know if that was... a. The Japanese uh, production or... Chinese, yeah, but that, that was a worldwide hit for sure. I, there's a lot of movies that we'll never see. It's very hard, I mean, especially if you don't speak Mandarin or Cantonese, depending on where it's made, uh, that are not subtitled, so you're out of luck. You know, it's like French movies. There's some that just aren't, you know, and if you don't speak French, you're in trouble. So, um, you know... I'm sure there are, and I've tried to educate myself as much as I can, and I'm sure I just know the tip of the iceberg. Um, and I do think there are certain kinds of stories that are going to translate to each side equally well. It seems the hand-to-hand -hand combat, something that you seem to have in most of your movies, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, seems pretty popular in both the East and the West. It's certainly quick to understand who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. <laughs> Uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about your upcoming movie, uh, but before we do that, and then we will take a few questions from the audience if we have time, uh, but before we do that, let me ask you a um, more of a policy question. Let's pretend you were king of Hollywood uh, and or king of the United States. Uh, how can the U.S. and China cooperate in the film and TV area? What could be done to get both sides to feel more... Uh, excited about cooperation in film and TV making? I think it's happening, actually. I think it's stopping and starting because there are hard lessons to be learned. And I think the only thing we can do is try to accelerate the pace of it because the more we do it, the more we're going to get more refined at it. Um, I think there's a real appetite on both sides to understand what the other wants and how to get about it. But... That takes time to develop that sense of trust with one another, and it takes time to sort of make some mistakes. And I think we will see, unfortunately, we will see some bad co-production movies because they, don't, they didn't get it right about what it is that's universal about a movie story. And you'll see some really good ones because they got it. And so that lesson, like every lesson, and sadly, is you have to fail some to get it right. Um, that's in the process happening right now. Okay. Uh, so if you've made 20, 25 movies as a producer, uh, how many scripts have you read? I have no idea. More than 10,000? Probably. More than 100,000? No, no, no. Probably around probably 10 or 20,000 scripts. Yeah. And how, how long does the process take? I mean, for instance, this movie hours. you have coming up. Uh, how, how many years has that movie been on your... Uh, to develop? On your, on your desk. <laughs> 
Uh, that movie, this movie, we're talking about Only yeah. the Brave. Only the Brave, which is coming out tomorrow. Um, w- started from my experience. I'd heard some things on the news about this story, and then I had read an article, and one of the people in my company had read an article uh, in GQ about this story. So we inquired about it. We ended up partnering with Condé Nast, which is the pub- has is the publisher. Um, and uh, from that, we then had to find a writer, then we had to write a script, then we had to find somebody who wanted to buy it. So pro- this case has actually happened quite fast. I'm going to say two and a half or three years. Was Matrix the longest process you ever went through? No, no. Matrix was about six years, and you know, uh, I made a movie uh, uh, this last year, American Assassin. It was nine and a half or ten years. All right, tell us uh, about uh, Only the Brave, and then we'll watch a trailer uh, for your movie opening tomorrow. Well, what's great about this story is it's really a celebration of who these men and women and their families are. Uh, What's interesting, there is some tragedy in this story, but what is interesting, as we got into this story more and more, it became more and more about the people, and so this movie is amazingly uplifting, and you can see by the level of cast we attracted, the story is very compelling and the characters are very compelling. And as a result, the movie kept elevating itself. And um, that's a great example of like, we had a really good script and we attracted a good director. And then we were able to really get a phenomenal cast with those two things, which then, you know, people sometimes will say to me, well, ah, the movie was so much better than the script. Well, yeah, there's some actors and directors that have something to do with elevating it, you know. In this case, extraordinary performances all the way through. A uh, lot of laughs. Uh, it's a, it, as I said, it's an unexpectedly vibrant, uplifting story for a story that has an element of tragedy in it. Great. Let's watch the trailer for Only the Brave. I, thank you. Thank you. It's, it, 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 this is an incredibly well done movie. I highly recommend it. I don't always feel that way about every movie I've worked on. But, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about watching this now is uh, we have a Chinese distributor leading media. And uh, I think that movie has a real chance to translate because who doesn't understand protecting your home? Who doesn't understand brotherhood? Who doesn't understand uh, the sense of real life cost of decisions? They're all things that are incredibly universal. Yeah, it happens to be a fire crew in Prescott, Arizona. But everything they do and are about is pretty universal. And you would, you would dub that in China, or would you subtitle it? You know, it's really up to the distributor. I've found they generally do both. Because this clearly has a Southern American kind of accent. Uh, Southwest America. South, yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, I think that's I wanted to say uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, redneck, but yeah, I didn't but know if I could. I don't think the accent's important. Uh, it is to us in the United States because we recognize it regionally specific, but I don't think if you're in China that's going to have a tremendous impact one way or another. Okay. Do we have time to take a, a question or two? We have a couple questions, okay. Mike. All right. Let's go one, two, and then we'll see if we've got time for a third. Hi, Lorenzo. Thank you for being here with us, and thank you for coming to my class at USC a couple weeks ago. That was very cool. Um, I wanted to ask you, specifically talking about Age of Extinction and filming filming in China, uh, what you would do, I know if you've filmed there again since, but uh, I was curious what you would do differently the next time and how you'd like to integrate China moving forward. Well, I think my experience, even when you go to a place like London, where I've probably shot Twelve movies. Each time is a new experience, and uh, you learn something in the previous one that you try to apply, and then you find out certain things have changed. I, I think the thing that I would um, m- probably more quickly do is I would get crew, a Chinese crew and American crew together for a banquet very early in the process, so people didn't have to feel each other out so much through work and they got to know each other a little bit on the private side of things. And, and I think that's one of the lessons is, is that it might have taken us a little too long in integration on that movie because we didn't foster an outside work experience before work. You know, I don't think from a technical point of view, I mean, there's certain things you learn, like um, getting things through in customs in China is extremely hard. So that's something that we had been told you should do 
I want to say three months before you're going to do it. I would do it six months before. So there's practical things that uh, you have to adjust to, you know, and then there's things that are just going to change for you. Hopefully no drivers are going to tear up our location sheets next time. <laughs> Did I, were you raising your hand? Okay. And then we'll go to the woman in the back and then we'll have to be done or in the third row, excuse me. Uh, thank you for coming. I also saw you at USC last year uh, talking about Deepwater Horizon and your big inspiration. And it seems as an independent producer, you've kind of honed in on these um, real life stories about people facing these decisions in these disaster spectacle films. And I was wondering um, if you have more creative control as an independent producer and what are some of the benefits and obstacles of independent producing versus uh, studio producing? Well, actually, Deepwater was for Lionsgate and this was for Sony. So. Uh, it, What's interesting about a real story, though, is is that you have more control in the sense that the story dictates the control. So nobody can say, no, 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 you can't do that. You go, wait a second, that's what happened, you know. So I think on that level, you don't have to contend with as much uh, disagreement because uh, my lesson, which I learned first on Perfect Storm many years ago, is that uh, the movie has a greater degree. It's easy to say you have more authenticity. Uh, to be truer to the story. But the truth is, the more truer you are to the story, the better the movie gets. Uh, it's not just the authenticity. There's something about the experience of it that changes, that you can accept it as a real thing is a very different emotional experience than a fictional thing. So um, I highly recommend that genre because in a certain level, it's also something that you get incredible sustenance out of because you interact with these families who've had loss and you, inter and you see the joy in them seeing their loved ones recreated and, and celebrated. Uh, that's not something you get when you make uh, Salt or Transformers or you know, name a fictional movie. You just don't have that human connection. So Smoochie. There you go, <laughs> death to Smoochie. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, that is a really rewarding thing as, a produ as anybody. The, the actors will tell you, the director will tell you, the producer, and the studios to some degree. They all get emotionally involved in a way that's very different. Thank you. Sorry, the woman in the third row, I think you had your hand up. Hi. Um, pleasure to be here today. I've enjoyed listening to you talk. Uh, one of the things you've, we haven't talked about is the music component to your films and how you choose a composer, um, how important the music is to your product, and have you ever collaborated with a Chinese composer? Um, I don't think I have collaborated with a Chinese composer yet. We've had some music that we've used from, from Chinese composers, um, but it was already created and we saw a place for it. Um, I do something different than a lot of people. When I first work on a movie, I don't want to have sound. I don't want to hear dialogue. I don't want to hear music. I want to see if I can follow the story visually. Um, and the difference between then turning on the dialogue and then finding the dialogue, when you see music put on in that next stage, it lifts up the movie anywhere from 40 to 50%, in my opinion, probably sometimes more. So it is wildly important you get that right score because uh, a clunky one really disrupts the uh, flow of the experience. And, and uh, for instance, on Only the Brave, the balance we were trying to walk on that thing uh, from a storytelling point of view was the exaltation of and respect of these guys with the fear of what they go through. So how do you make sure emotionally that, you know, how do you express that to a composer? Here's where we want you to be, and they're kind of looking at you. So it's a little bit of um, trial and error then, and their instincts, you know, and the great film composers completely transform a movie. There's a reason why, you know, people go back to the same composer. I don't know how many John Williams has done with Steven Spielberg. A lot. Uh, you know, he, obviously, Steven sees that his movies get elevated by John. And I think we all celebrate his music. So, uh, to a large extent, though, it is a trial and error, usually, because you don't always have that long-term collaboration. Okay. One right oh, okay. What, go ahead. They're yeah. going to cut us off at one point, but go ahead. You, you seem eager. 
Can we get the microphone back to you, though? Okay. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> We're listening carefully. Okay. So I, I heard that it was due to some logistical uh, measures that you had to build a segment of uh, Detroit, Michigan mm -hmm. to appear like China. Yep. And um, so my question is, does that happen often, A, and B, when these things happen, do you look for cities in America that are economically repressed that would truly benefit from the influx of the movie production budget? I'll answer the second first, which is we would love that to be, and it is part of the criteria, but the city does have to double for the other city. So, you know, we do, you know, we made a big effort post Katrina to get down to New Orleans on a picture. Um, uh, when we did Deepwater Horizon, that, that community had suffered a great deal from that devastation, and we felt we owed it to them, even though there was a place we could have shot for a little less money. We felt like that would be wrong not to go. So sometimes you can mix those things. Uh, in this specific case, one of the reasons why we chose Detroit is, sadly, because it's such ruined, and you can blow things up quite easily there. And try to blow things up like that in Hong Kong, you've got a riot on your hands. So uh, not the least of which they probably wouldn't let you do it. So it was actually very practical. We created Hong Kong and Detroit, uh, or a part of Hong Kong. And we had a lot of our open-ended battles where things are really blowing up and going uh, quite chaotically. Unfortunately, in a very depressed area of downtown Detroit, um, that uh, economically they benefited from us all spending several months there in hotels and all the things we do. So, um, but at the end of the day, you've got to double it, you know? Um, and there are, and, and so many movies double where they, you know, I shot a movie in London that the entire movie takes place in the United States. Uh, we came to the United States for a day. So That's because the British gave you a good package? Partly because it was economically advantageous and partly because um, the professionals there knew how they could do that. You know, they knew how to recreate New York City. So we went to New York City for one day to get the sense of it, and, and, and it's a lot of interiors in that case, so then it does become about economics to some extent. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Lorenzo. Thanks, we everybody. Thank you.